Hey y'all, Nick here. In this episode, we're going to continue to build our knowledge together on how to develop software for the Ethereum blockchain. In the last video, we went through a real brief overview of what a blockchain is and what Ethereum is fundamentally. We didn't really dive into a crazy amount of detail. There's a, there's a ton of that content available today and the rabbit hole goes really deep. Um, we kind of settled on what we have on the screen here where we said, simply put, Ethereum is a distributed, global, public, permissionless computing platform. And that's pretty loaded, um, but basically what that means is, is that we can develop software and deploy it to basically a computer that is running all over the world. And these programs that we would develop follow certain characteristics and we're in a phase of of the internet today where there's a lot of experimentation and new ideas being shared new ideas being developed um, and it's a very exciting time for this area of development so what i'd like to do in this video is give you a brief overview of what a program written for ethereum would look like introduce you to the basic structure of the specific programming language that we're going to be looking at, um, and then building from there. All right, so if uh, we want to build a, a program for Ethereum, we typically call, we, we call programs that we deploy to Ethereum smart contracts. Smart contracts being that they live on the blockchain and they are immutable. They cannot change. So once we push them up to the, the network, they get mined into a block, and that's where they live forever. And of course, we can write things within our programs to be able to turn certain things off, turn certain things on. There are very there are a lot of different patterns that are emerging with how you develop these pieces of software. But as we saw in the last video, Ethereum fundamentally exposes what we call the Ethereum EVM, right? So the Ethereum EVM has what we call opcodes. Now, these opcodes define the different instructions that we can use to develop software. So you can think of this as kind of like a low level language, almost like, I would say like assembly language. If anybody's ever heard of assembly language, where it's, it's slightly above writing directly in binary, uh, but it's a little bit more usable or human readable, right? Um, where you have things like an add operation or a multiply operation, divide, um, do, do a modulus function, um, do an exponential operation. So there are these kind of core fundamental features that are exposed through these opcodes that really make up or comprise what that Ethereum virtual machine is, which runs inside of the node software that various different projects implement, such as Geth. So people all around the world are running these nodes. These nodes keep track of the entire blockchain. They, they communicate with each other through a peer-to-peer -peer network. And what emerges from that is this highly distributed network of computing power. Now us as developers can now write software and deploy that software to that network. You can almost think of it as open application programming interfaces that we don't have to maintain a backend for. We can, of course we can run our own nodes, but we can deploy these to this distributed network um, and they will live on that network without having to you know, spin up servers on Amazon Web Services or any other cloud provider. Now, of course, that doesn't mean this is going to replace all of your current compute infrastructure and any applications that you're running uh, within certain systems that you, that you already have in place. But there may be some interesting um, interesting ideas and opportunities to, to develop some, some interesting software that could add value to um, whatever type of project you're trying to develop. So what I'd like to do today is really introduce you to uh, the core concept of how do we how do we actually do this? What what is what is entailed here? Are we going to write these opcodes directly? Right? And we're going to sit here and write and add, multiply, sub 
I don't think so, right? And, and typically when we write software, we're not writing in assembly language. We typically have what we call a high level language that we deal with, that we work with. And that high level language really abstracts away these lower level concepts into a much more usable environment for us to craft our solution. So there are a couple of different languages, high level languages that are built on top of these opcodes. Um, the one that seems to be the most popular right now um, is called Solidity. So jumping right into this, how do we actually develop programs on Ethereum? We would use the Solidity programming language. So the Solidity programming language is a high level language that allows us to basically develop smart contracts. It is a compiled language. It's statically typed. Um, and for those of you that uh, have used other languages in the past, like JavaScript or C++ or even Python, there's a lot of different ideas that have been extracted from, from those environments. And I think that you'll see that the syntax, that the, the actual format of the code is very familiar. It's not something that um, is completely foreign if you're familiar with you know, languages like JavaScript. Um, so this is, this is one of the more popular growing and ever evolving high level languages that exist today. And we're going to dive into this language a, a bunch in this series of vid videos. So their documentation here is, is really good. There's a lot of great information here. Um, and you can see that you know, they describe it here. Solidity is a curly bracket language. It's influenced by C++, Python, and JavaScript. Um, curly bracket, meaning that we open and close code blocks with curly brackets, as you'll see in a minute. Um, but this is a compiled language. So we do use a compiler. We compile it uh, so that it will run on the EVM. So typically when you're running on a virtual machine, you would compile into a bytecode. Uh, and that bytecode basically is those opcodes, are those opcodes that run within these EVMs. And then we store all that information in on the blockchain so it's going to be living within an address on the ethereum blockchain and that address is really where we would go to call into all the functionality that we've developed within that contract so before i dive into the code what are some applications that are popular today um, on the ethereum blockchain and I think a couple of them you probably already have used or, or know of already, things like the ERC-20 token, right? Being able to develop your own token contract so that you can create your own cryptocurrency, right? And we have we have a tool with, at Ally Blockchain that allows you to do just that. You could just go click a button and it'll go ahead and put out a smart contract with the ERC-20 token that you, you own. Um, another one is the ERC-721 standard, which is the NFT contract standard that allows us to create NFTs or non-fungible tokens. Right now, we're in a phase where NFTs are kind of really exploding and they're, they're exposing all these different ideas and, and experimentations around how we can bring communities together and, and all this crazy stuff. But these are all patterns that are starting to emerge as we discover different ways to create programs in this new environment. And Solidity is the tool that's being used to be able to create the back end of all of these experiences that run right on the blockchain. So to get started with Solidity, what I want to do is I want to take it really, really slow because I want to keep these videos as compact and just as, as much value as I can pack into a 15 minute time frame. So what I'd like to do is show you a web based development environment that is really good to kind of just start getting started with just just, just to get started with the the basics of solidity and this this environment comes right out of the ethereum foundation it's called remix and if we go to remix.ethereum.org it's going to dump you right into an online ide now this IDE has a bunch of features. I'm not gonna go into them all now, but what I wanna do is, is really just go through a quick development cycle of developing a smart contract, compiling that smart contract, and then trying to run some of the functionality. So let's go ahead and do that. So this IDE looks a lot like VS Code, right? You got some buttons along the left-hand side here. You've got your file explorer, and you have 
um, you know, kind of home screen right here linking you out to other things. You also have a, a little console down here giving you some information about your environment and what's currently installed on it. Um, when you come to this site, there are some predefined contracts written. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to actually delete these bad boys. We're not going to go into them just yet. They are really uh, useful to read and maybe we'll dive into some of the details with them later on. Uh, but they do go up in complexity. So the storage one is, is a, not really much code. The owner has a little bit more and the ballot is a bit more of a, a larger contract. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to delete all this stuff. Um, I'm going to say delete this and we'll just delete all of these. We may actually be able to just do delete all. I thought I saw delete all there, but we're going to go ahead and delete all this stuff. Now what we'll do is we're going to right click the contracts folder and go to new file. And I'm going to say hello world dot S O L or soul. Okay, now we have a blank canvas. We can go ahead and now write um, whatever we want to write. So typically, the first two lines of any .sol file are going to be your SpeedX or SBDX license identifier. So this is something that's encouraged um, to put into really just not smart contracts, but I believe any, any real uh, source code here is something that identifies the type of uh, of license that this code is released under because this is still code it's still copyrightable information so i'm going to put this as mit and you can read more about that um, here there's a whole this is actually an iso standard for um, being able it stands for software package data exchange and uh, it's iso 5962 so you're going to see a lot of smart contracts put that SpeedX or SPDX line in there. The next piece is what we're going to call the pragma. So a pragma declaration is basically like a, a compiler declaration here. So we're telling the compiler certain things. Um, in this case, we're going to tell it the version of Solidity uh, that we'll, we will support. So we're going to say pragma Solidity, and I'm going to say we'll support up to 0.8.0. Now this follows a specific syntax that basically says we'll support anything like 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, 8.4. We will not support 0 0.5. We will not support anything that goes to an, another version like that. So saying 8.0 here says any of the dot eights we're going to be able to support. And this will throw a compiler error if you're using a compiler that's not within the versions we state here. This is super useful when, you know, this is this is a fast moving target with smart contract development. Things change rather quickly. So um, having this in there is very helpful. If there's new features that are in the newer compilers, you have to compile with an older compiler. So you want to have your pragma in here. This should also be included in every single smart contract file that you create. Now, next piece here is going to look very familiar if you're if you're familiar with object-oriented programming. So when we're talking about object-oriented programming, if we were to create, say, a class, we would define a class by using a class keyword. So we would say class, hello world, and then open and close curlies if we're using a, a language that uses a curly brace syntax. This one does. Um, it's the same exact way. The only difference is instead of saying class, we're going to say contract. So now we're defining a smart contract using the contract keyword and saying hello world. This right here is the basic structure of what a smart contract looks like at the bare minimum. Now, just like in the object oriented world, we do have what's called a constructor. Now a constructor is a function or within a given object, we would call that a method that gets called whenever the object, or in this case, the smart contract is created. So we could do that by saying constructor, and I always spell constructor wrong, constructor, 
and then we can pass in different parameters to our constructor. In this case, I'm actually not going to put anything in our constructor. It's just going to be empty. I just wanted to illustrate that the, the constructor exists. We can where we would use the instructor is maybe to initialize um, internal properties and properties being you know variables that live with inside of our contract or what we would call storage. We'll talk about storage in, a, in another in another episode here. But um, the next piece here is really defining methods or functions. So here we're going to define a function. And this may look familiar to you if you're familiar with JavaScript. Um, we just type the function keyword. And we just will say, say hello. And I'm using camel case here as my kind of way I'm typing out the uh, function names. You can use whatever. Um, type of syntax that your team or yourself are comfortable with. And we'll open and close there. We're not going to pass in any parameters. There are some attributes that we can add to these methods that will that give it its visibility. If you're familiar with object oriented programming, you may have used public, private or protected methods. This is really important when we're talking about smart contract development. Smart contract development we, there may be certain functions that we don't want folks to be able to call, but we do want privileged folks to be able to call. Things like, you know, setting the value of a certain uh, price of, of, a, of a token um, or changing the ownership of a smart contract. In this case, we're going to keep it really simple and we're just going to say that this is a public function and that's it. And we're going to say it returns something. So we'll say returns open string. And we're going to put this memory keyword in there. And then we're going to open and close curly. Now, there are a couple of interesting things happening here that may not look familiar to you if you're coming from other environments. First of all, a lot of this information is kind of after the function declaration, which to me, working in other environments, was a little... Uh, different. I mean, some in, in other languages, you typically put like your return, uh, return value here, return type here. Um, we put that at the end here. Um, we also declared public after. You know, typically, in, in other languages, you would put it here. So it's it's a little bit in in my mind backwards from what I traditionally think about. It may not be for you, and that's that's all good. This is just syntax. I always, you know, discourage folks from getting too caught up on syntax. Obviously, it's important because you need to be able to compile this code. But as you use it, you'll get used to it. So now we have this public method and it returns a string. Now, this little memory keyword is important. This is saying that this variable that it returns is, is going to be stored in memory within the EVM, which is going to is just like computer memory in, in many cases where it can be cleared. We call it volatile, right? So it, it's going to be cleared. And from the cost perspective, how much gas it's going to cost to be able to run and create this smart contract, it does have a, an impact. I won't go too much into that right now, but it, it does matter. So now what we want to do here is we just want to return a greeting. So we're going to go ahead and say return hello world. That's it. So we're just going to go ahead and return that string. And we do put a semicolon at the end there. And that is it. So now this is our first smart contract. Now this is complaining about something. Oh, because I didn't put my semicolon there. <laughs> so you do need to rem remember to put your semicolon there. Um, okay. Okay, that should be okay. All right, awesome. So let's go ahead and try to compile this. So now how do we compile this? You notice here that there were a couple of files created here, created some what we call artifacts. Um, but we should be able to go ahead and try to compile. So if we go ahead and click this Solidity Compiler button, this is going to ask us what version of the compiler we want to compile for, what language we're working in. There are a couple of languages this supports. And let's go ahead and just click this compile button. There shouldn't be anything we need to change. Oh, it is complaining that we didn't include the license identifier. Did I spell this wrong? I may have.
Okay, we'll go ahead and do that. All right, this might be complaining because I did not. Function state mutability can be restricted to pure. Public returns relevant source parts here span across multiple lines. Okay, so we're getting a we're getting a warning here. We can hide the warnings and, and it will compile, but a better a better way to do this is we can add a, a small keyword here that would eliminate this warning. Basically, what it's saying is that we should put the pure um, keyword in here to basic basically explicitly declare that we do not change any state within this within this method call. So if we put pure here and then try to compile, we're looking good. We have a little gr green check mark check box here and the compiled and the contract compiled successfully. So basically what that pure does is it it states that this this method doesn't do anything to the internal state of the smart contract. It's pure. It doesn't doesn't make any changes. So we're all good to go. So now once we have it compiled we can go here and we can actually deploy the smart contract. So there are a couple of stages to creating smart contracts. There's actually writing the code, compiling the code, and then deploying the code to a chain. Now, as we're going through the development cycle, it typically goes through deploying it to a local test chain that typically has fake accounts with fake balances. And we can you know, play around with the different, uh, different pieces of software are writing, we can break it, we can test it and things like that. Then stage two is to deploy to a test network. And then stage three is to go live and, and deploy to a, a production network. So what I'd like to do here is just kind of end this video with running this simple smart contract that we just wrote. So if we go here to the deploy and run, I'm going to go ahead and say deploy, we're going to run it to the JavaScript VM. Um, this is this is automatically running on a test account. So there's 100 ether in all of these accounts. Um, we don't have to change anything here. This is the contract that we're compiling, I mean deploying, and we can just hit deploy. We're going to see a little indicator down here that it deployed, and then here we can see deployed contracts. Drop that bad boy down, and now we have a button for the method that we created here, and this is how we can actually run our code within this environment. So let's go ahead and click say hello. And boom, you'll see here that it returns a string and it says, hello world. So that is it at a super simple level. This is our first smart contract. Uh, just a quick recap. We have our SpeedX license identifier at the top. We have our Pragma that declares exactly what Solidity compiler version we can support. And we have our basic structure for a smart contract, which looks a lot like a class declaration and object-oriented programming languages. And then inside of them, we have our methods, including the a con constructor to be able to initialize any internal properties or, or set up our contract for execution. All right, guys, in the next video, we're going to build on these ideas. We're going to see maybe how do we use storage? How do we actually store properties and state within a, a smart contract? Um, we'll probably work within this remix environment for the next couple of lessons possibly and then dive into some of our local tools we can use to kind of level up and start to do some uh, do some development on our local machines all right guys any questions comments please leave them below if you're enjoying this please subscribe like love to hear from you guys any feedback that you have um, awesome happy developing thanks